Welcome everyone. There we go. Great. So, isn't this an awesome space? Yeah. Yeah. So, kudos to uh, Chloe Powell, the Chandler's excellent ED, and the Chandler board for all of this beautiful renovation for this terrific resource for our community. So, my name is Annette Higby. I'm the chair of the Bethany Peace and Justice Committee. Um, and I'm here to welcome you to the inaugural Betty Edson Peace and Justice Lecture, or as we've been referring to it, our first rodeo. So, so Betty, Betty Edson was a big part of my life and certainly the life of this community and throughout Vermont. Um, she was a tireless advocate for economic justice. She lived every day the lesson from Matthew, which is that what you do, what you did for the least of these, you did for me. Um, she also uh, believed that we could bridge the deep political divides among us through education, um, discussion, compassion, um, and listening. And that's the spirit in which we gather here today to honor Betty. Hi, everyone. We are so delighted to see you here today at Bethany Church. We've been waiting for this day for a good long time. We have thought over the last couple of years of a fitting way to honor Betty Edson. She was our light. And those of you who know her know that. And it was Annette's brilliance to pull out of thin air the name Sister Simone Campbell. Annette knew what the rest of us were soon to know, that there could hardly be a better person to honor Betty in this first of what we hope will be an annual lecture series than Sister Simone because the things that mattered so much to Betty are the things that Sister Simone has dedicated her life to, economic inequality and bridging the divide between people. Sister Simone is a sister of social service. She has dedicated her ministry to health care policy and to just taxation. There are echoes of that already in what you've heard here today. Sister Simone is a religious leader. You might have figured that out already. But she is also an attorney. She went to law school so that she could better advocate for those whose lives were on the margin those whose lives she wanted to speak to and for, those who had a voice but that wasn't being heard. In 2022, President Biden bestowed on Sister Simone the Presidential Medal of Freedom, which is the highest civilian honor our nation bestows given to those who have given meritorious service to their country. The president knew what he was doing when he gave this award to Sister Simone. And so we honor Betty with these words from Sister Simone. And we want to, before we get to our beloved sister, we want to introduce a couple of other beloveds. Betty's daughters, Susan and Lynn, are here. Would you stand up? I think there are a few people who want to say hello to you. <laughs> So now we have the opportunity to listen deeply to one who has listened deeply to others for decades, to one whose life has been lived in responding to the needs and struggles of so many. 
She has amplified those voices and she has advocated for folks all across our nation and beyond whose needs are overlooked and undervalued. Please join me in welcoming Sister Simone. Thank you for that really kind introduction. Um, I, I have a beginning to my talk, but I have to start with the presentations that we just had with a little news from outside Vermont. Um, and because the, uh, the issue of transportation to the medical facility up in Burlington, well, you know what happened in Adrian, Michigan? The Adrian, Michigan is a small town and the neighboring town about 10 miles away had another hospital. Adrian had a hospital. A hospital system bought both hospitals and decided on for economy of scale, they were going to build a new hospital right in between the two towns. But and then they tore down the old hospitals. But there wasn't any bus transportation. There wasn't any way to get to the hospital. So this being Michigan, the people in Detroit at the central office wrote a grant proposal, or wrote a grant uh, proposal to Ford Motor Company to provide self-driving cars to get to the hospital. <laughs> but what they didn't know is it's very hilly in Adrian and the cell phone loses coverage when you're at the bottom of the hill, but it's okay at the top. And, and they had two self-driving cars that they were testing out and they both got stuck at the bottom of the hill. <laughs> And then they finally had to go back to plan B to try to organize some other form of transportation. This wasn't gonna work. So I just wanna commend the Burlington folks for finally getting their act together and talking to each other and actually figuring something out. Now, much of my talk is gonna be about taxes. So I'm gonna save that part from the federal way, uh, the federal approach. But I, I want to lift up the immigration reality because la realidad es eso. The truth is this, is that our economy depends on immigrant labor. And the exploitation that is going on because of undocumented status is benefiting many who don't want to solve the problem. And your experience in 2017, what happened in 2017? Who became president? Is an exact correlation with the reality of who is in government. And one of the things that we need to ensure is that fixing our broken immigration system becomes the response, a reasonable response, a just response to a system that we have allowed since 1996 to be broken. So this is not a new issue, but it's one we cannot afford to go unaddressed. So that is my small political announcement that had nothing to do with what I wrote to talk about, but I am moved because of your presentation. La presentación era muy importante para nosotras aprender la realidad de sus vidas. Gracias a ustedes para esto. So uh, it was really important that we learn from them the reality, and I just thank them for, the, for sharing their, their story, their truth. Okay. Now back to our regular programming. Um, what I wanted to do, because hearing about Betty and hearing about the 
care for the economic realities of what happens, I, I really wanted to take some time and look at um, what's happening with regards to income in our nation. And one of the things that is hard, many of us have gray hair, like me, and so we know a story about a United States that was very different than the current reality of our economy. And I think one of the things that's hard is because we knew growing up, us gray-haired people, those non-gray-haired people might want to talk to us about what was it like back in the good old days. But when we grew up in the 50s and 60s, maybe even the 40s, the reality was that the income was in the country was shared significantly among everybody. The top tax bracket, the top tax bracket was 91%, meaning that 91% of your income over a certain amount went to the government in taxes. 91%. Well, if 91% of your income goes to the government, you don't have a big incentive for getting a higher salary. But what has happened is as the reduction of those top tax brackets then began fueling interest in getting bigger salaries. So what we want to look at, wait a minute, do I have any, let me see here. So between 1950 and 1980, everyone's income went up about 20%. And I used to do this human bar graph that we're going to see, hopefully, um, for that period, 50 to 80. It was boring. Everybody got the same. Everybody ended clumped up together. But that's no longer true and has not been true since 1980. Among the things that happened was uh, President Ronald Reagan. Ronald Reagan really shifted the narrative about the founding story of the United States. Pre-Reagan, the story was, oh, there was the Mayflower, and it was a group of pilgrims came, and they began to, you know, create community and make the United States. were a little unpleasant to the Native Americans, but, you know. And then there was a group that went to Maryland and a group that went to Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, William Penn, but it was groups, it was community. Reagan changed that to say, oh no, it was one man riding on his horse off into the West. And it was that one person alone settled the West. Oh, brother, liar, liar, pants on fire. That did not happen. But it was an appealing story at the time, and it began to shift our consciousness from community to individualism. And it's that move about individualism that has resulted in the question being asked, which Reagan asked first, are you better off than you were four years ago? As if it were an individual question. When the real issue about being um, a nation is what our founding documents say, we the people, as opposed to I the individual. And so some of the tension that we're seeing is this individualism is fracturing. We've gone to the um, ultimate extent extreme of individualism. I was recently in Boise, Idaho, and I was talking to a high school class, and the first question from this kid, a senior, said to me, well, what do you think is, well, what's wrong with having your own truth? Uh, well, uh, that wouldn't be a general truth, would it? I mean, but it was shocking to me that a senior in high school would think that my private truth is okay. Because who are you connected to? Who supports you? 
How do you live if you've got your private truth? Whew. Anyway, that's a whole other thing. Well, we could talk about education afterwards, but anyway, oh, I just feel so sorry for teachers. Oh my God, what a mess. Um, so, Ronald Reagan said, we're individuals, and he's the first one to call taxes, which had been seen as an investment in our nation. So he starts calling it a tax burden. You shouldn't be burdened so much. That's just really hard. Well, it's sort of like saying, in my family, my aunt struggled, and so we always supported my aunt. We never thought of that as a burden. My aunt was family. Of course we're going to support her. Isn't that how we are as a nation? Shouldn't we be supporting each other? Hello. But Ronald Reagan said, no, it's about the individual. And so that 91% tax bracket, and uh, what you need to know, and I've got to get these details correct here. OK, so. In the 1960s and 70s, there were 24 tax brackets. And 19 of those tax brackets were higher than the highest bracket now. And then you get a party who wants to talk about the deficit as being a problem of spending. 19 of the 24 tax brackets are higher than what the top bracket is now. The issue is balance, and the issue is how do we flourish together. And so what we want to do is look at flourishing together as being the goal for where we're being called as a nation on the good days. On the bad days, we just sort of fight with each other. But I, I like to think we're being called to a good place. So what I would like to do is to invite, I need help. Can I have five people for a standing, non-speaking part? Would five people be willing to help me? Just come on up if you've got five people. This is always the hard part for me. OK, there's one. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah two. I got four. I need one more. Five. God love you. Come on up. Oh, look at you. Whoa. All right. OK. Oh, this is going to be fun. I know. It's a, a challenge. I didn't say you had to be like a mountain goat. OK, here we go. All right. So just come clump up. Perfect, perfect. OK, um, I need your name. Susan, Susan you're going to be the top 20%. <laughs> I know you're going to love it. Yeah. Uh, go against type, I'm sure. OK, Susan. Gene. Gene. OK, you're going to be the next highest. Harvey. Harvey, you are the beloved middle class. No matter what a person's income is, they believe they're middle class. No, seriously, seriously. And it's because it's in the myth of that single person riding off into the sunset. I got to be in the middle. I'm, I'm middle class. That's where I am. So, I mean, we've got Susan, Jean, Harvey, Mickey. Mickey. You're going to be next to the bottom. Okay. It's a really important spot. Okay. And Ellie, Ellie you're going to be our bottom. Okay. okay. Good foundation. OK, so what's going to happen is here is we're going to make a human bar graph. And remember school? This is an x axis goes this way. Y axis goes that way. OK, so um, oh, Susan, God love you. Thank you. Susan, come line yourself up here. Uh, going the other way. Now, I would like you to see that the 20%, top 20%, has already taken a little extra space. You're supposed to line up on the edge. <laughs> Back another inch, a little further. Ah, 
Oh, oh no, we lost the X axis. Careful. Okay, there we go. Okay, Susan. I we're going to look at the period from 1980 to 2016. Okay, and in those between 1980 and 2016. I'm pleased to tell you that your income, and this is calculated for standardized for inflation, and so it's not inflationary. We figured out, somebody in my office figured all that out. Don't ask me how they did it, but I trust them. Um, so your income went up 65% in that period. Okay, so you're gonna take some serious steps and you're gonna take one step for every 5% change and I've done the math. So it turns out, yeah, you're going this way. So uh, 13%, I mean you get 13 steps because of 65%, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, keep going, 9, 10, 11, 12, go down these steps, 13, 13, you're there. Very nicely done. Okay, Jean, come on, come on down. And Jean, during this same period, I'm pleased to tell you, well, you can actually come up an inch. You can get your feet right, there you go. Um, I'm pleased to tell you that your income went up 31%. So you get six steps, you ready? One, two, three, four, five, six. Very nice. And Harvey? Harvey. Look at the middle class lining up perfectly. <laughs> We're so docile. Really doing a good job, Harvey. Okay, so your income in the same period 80 to 2016, went up 20%. Um, so you get four steps. One, two, three, four. Well done. Mickey, Mickey, come on down. Okay, Mickey, so get yourself lined up. Now don't be shy, come all the way up. <laughs> well, well, now you went too far, on the back side. <laughs> okay. So your income went up 16% in the same period. So you get three steps. You ready? One, two, three. Well done. And Ellie. Ellie, lo siento mucho, amiga mia. Well, you can come up a little closer to the line. It's okay. Um, your income went up eight percent and you get a step and a half one oops now we lost her oops, sorry that's right there we go oops nothing like losing your x-axis <laughs> okay so look at this in this alleged tax policy that was gonna be really good, because remember the top bracket was 91%, we end up with this big extreme of what's happening in income. And what you mentioned about the 2017 federal tax bill has made it only worse. So we're gonna look at between 2017 and 2000. Oh yeah, well, no, first we're gonna do something else. Sorry, sorry, sorry. I was so excited to get to this part about the 17 tax bill. Okay, so I need two more people to help me. I just need two more people. You've seen it's easy, it's not scary. Yep, come on up, come on up. Can you manage? Youthful knees, that's wonderful. Okay, now, we have Susan. Susan, over here, the 1%, or uh, excuse me, the top 20%. She's hiding something though, not intentionally. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna ask, 
What's your name? Sue. Sue. Okay, Sue and Susan. This is good. Well, You're going to. I'm Susan also, but I go by Sue. Oh, okay, cool. <laughs> You're going to be the top 5%. And. Jess. Jess. You're going to be the top 1%. I hope you have your marching shoes on. Okay, so. Ek, uh, my bar graph, can you take a little step back because we're going to need this, need a little room here. Okay, Sue, line yourself up. Perfect, well done. Okay, so remember this is hidden in Sue's number. Remember she went up 13%? Well, I mean it's 13 steps, 65%. The top 5% between 1980 and 2016 I'm pleased and slightly horrified to tell you that their income went up 95%. So you get 19 steps. She has 13 already. She has, well, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, if you want to do it that way. Look at that calculating, it's fabulous. All right, 13. Yeah, deserving poor, I mean deserving rich. Okay, 13, okay. 14, 15, 6, go right, go right. That's what happens when you get wealthy. 14, <laughs> 16, 17, you got 19. You have to go down those steps. 18, 19, there you are. Okay, now, oh, I forgot your name. Jess. Jess. Now, I am truly horrified to tell you the top 1% in this same period of time, their income went up 205%. You get 41 steps. You ready? Okay, on your mark, get set. No, no, go right, go out here, go right, and then up the, up the, wow. Uh, okay, one, two, three. Okay, 19, we're gonna shortcut this. It's so much fun, can you believe this? Okay, okay, 19. Okay, and then 20, 21, 22, 23, 24, 25, 26, 27, 28, 29, 30, 31, 32, 33, 34, 35, 36, 37, 38, 39, 40, 41, there you are. What do you think? Out of sight, but not out of mind. Okay, so this is a piece of the trouble, is that those of us who grew up in the 50s and 60s, 40s, 50s, 60s, where everybody's income was about the same, is we continue with that myth in our head without seeing the consequences, the impact, of tax policy. So in 2017, the Republican tax bill um, cut taxes, allegedly for everybody. And so let's see what happened between 2017 and 2022. Uh, and some of it, it, a teeny bit affected by COVID, but for the most part, it, it's directly related just to tax policy. So I'm pleased to say that Ellie gets, you, your income went up because of tax policy, 3%. So you get a half a step this way. Yeah, take another inch. Okay. Um, Oh shoot, Mickey, your income went up an additional 5%. So you get another step, take another step. Eh, take an inch more. Okay, Harvey, thank you for help. Your income also went up 5%. Well done. Jean, Jean, your income also went up 5%. You get one step. Now, Susan, your income went up 8%, so you get a step and a half. One, you're gonna get halfway down that step. That'd be. But, Sue, your income 
went up 11%. So you get two steps. One, two. <laughs> Is it Jess? Yes. Jess? You who back there? I'm pleased and totally horrified to tell you that your income went up 20%. You get four more steps. One, two, three, four. Herein lies the trouble. Because the way we talk is as if we are all equally impacted. And we're not. A few years ago, I was doing uh, business roundtables. At the organization I led, when we didn't know something, we would go around the country and hold roundtables to try to understand. We did a series of business roundtables. We did a series of rural roundtables. And they're fabulous experiences. But I'll never forget being in Chicago with a bunch of, there were about eight CEOs of companies, like Jess back there. And it had just come out that the average salary of a CEO of a publicly traded company was $10 million. And they were going for $11 million. And so I got to say to these guys, so I gave them that detail, and I said, guys, what's wrong? I mean, do you need another mill? Is that the problem? Is that why you're going for 11? And this guy says, just like this, he says, oh, no, Sister Sue. It has nothing to do with the money. I go, what? He says, no, no, we're very competitive. We just want to win. It just happens that the measure of winning is money. So I said, could we find another measure? This is kind of destructive. But the problem is, is for Jess to feel like he's on top he needs more money. And I tested it out at another business roundtable, and this guy who was a CEO of an international hospitality company, he said, well, yeah, I'll be damned if I'm doing a better job and I'm going to get paid less than my competitor. That's how we know we're winning. How do we find a way to say, Jess, is as dependent on Ellie and the gang down here as he is on his salary. And, and, well, income, benefits. That's the challenge, is we don't see ourselves as being in this together anymore. And it all becomes about me and my tax burden. Does that make some sense? It's very worrisome because it's pulling us apart as a nation. And when it's only me and my tax reality and it's so divisive, then what happens is who sees each other? The folks at the bottom of the level see each other and so they're gonna blame each other. Well, you know, you got a, you got a raise and I didn't, Marty. Or, and like, well, you should have shown up on time, and I'm sure it's your fault. So we do things like that to each other what we, for, with people we see, but we don't see Jess. And Jess thinks his life is normative. He doesn't have the joy, I used to say, he doesn't have the joy of you know, riding on Southwest Airlines. <laughs> or taking the Amtrak up to Randolph. But the, the challenge is, is that this is dividing us. And we hardly even know it. And then we get arguments over organizing, like you all are doing in the dairy industry. Well, the organizing then can set workers at the bottom against each other because they're risking Jess's ire, his anger being upset. So tax policy makes a huge difference for social policy in our nation. Now what you might want to know is that at the end of 2025, the 2017 tax bill expires unless Congress acts. 
So we could take four steps back from Jess. It could happen. But it depends on this election. Elections have consequences. Okay, shall we thank our bar graph and continue? <laughs> thank you. You guys are great. Thanks, Jim. Ah, uh, thank you. Okay, what you don't know, what you can't tell, is Jess's paper is lighter weight, because one time, <laughs> the 1% walked off with the paper, so. <laughs> So what does this say? So what does this say about a, uh oh, yeah, everybody get down safe, Lee. Well, I wanna tell you some stories about people that I've met that this impacts and try to stretch our understanding so that we can be open missionaries, try to talk to people, listen to people. Actually, it's more important to listen in um, 2016, I met this guy in Indianapolis, and he was, um, I don't know what, he, he had done some sort of uh, steel work, mill work. He was kind of short, barrel-chested, muscular, and he had to be like in his 50s, and he was angry. And he, I said, well, what do you, what's going on? And he goes, I was always told, my parents always told me if you worked hard and played by the rules, you'd get ahead. And I worked hard and played by the rules and I didn't get ahead. And my kids are even having a harder time. And my parents had told me that you worked hard and played by the rules, you'd get ahead. And he's going on and on. Well, the reason I'd started talking to him was he had a MAGA hat on. So I was curious to understand. And so then I, okay, so he's angry that he didn't you know, work hard, played by the rules, you get ahead. And I, I talked to him, like he had been a union guy, he had worked hard, he had done everything, and now his kids had gone off to college and they had student debt and the, they hadn't been able to find good jobs so they had moved back home and everybody was trying to pay on their student debt and it was terrible and he was angry. And what I realized is his anger, he found uh, attractive in Trump, Trump's anger. And that attraction was about his suffering. It had nothing to do with Trump's politics. It had everything to do with his suffering that he had worked hard, played by the rules, and he didn't get ahead. And his parents had always promised him he'd get ahead, and he hadn't, and his kids hadn't gotten ahead. And finally, when he said for about the third time, that his parents had always told him this. I said to him, you know, you have, you have these leaps. I said to him, it sounds like you're, you feel like you disappointed your parents because you didn't get ahead. Is that true? And bam, he got tears in his eyes. Surprised me, surprised him. But what I realized was this human bar graph that we've just seen that stretches out the income was what had betrayed him from not be having the success his parents had experienced in the 40s, 50s, and 60s. And so it wasn't his fault, but he felt it was his fault and he was angry. And it was that anger that was fueling a politics that's fairly destructive because it's not based on the common good. That man haunts me and I, I, okay, I'm a person of prayer, so I pray for him regularly. And then last summer, I, um, my, my new project is I've been trying to get conservatives and progressives to talk to each other. And I have all these progressive friends who are willing to talk and all my conservative friends say, oh no, we'll talk to you, but we can't talk in a group. Oh no, we can't talk in a group. Oh no, 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 no. So what I decided to do was if I couldn't get them together, well then maybe what I needed to do was I needed to face into where I felt uncomfortable. And where I feel uncomfortable is the South. 
the South makes me nervous. Uh, I grew up in Southern California watching civil rights stuff on television and knowing what happened in Little Rock and Birmingham and all these places, and it scared me. So I went to the South. Somebody, t <laughs> one person said, someone, you're, you're crazy. Only you would go face into it by just going there. But what I learned in the South was the story that they carry, that, that the South carries in their bones is a story of loss. They are still, for the most part, focused on what happened in the Civil War and the anger of the economic destruction that happened after the Civil War. And what I came to realize or, or heard was from Birmingham that in 1950s and 1960s, Birmingham and Atlanta were the same size. Well, if anybody knows Atlanta, how many people have been to Atlanta nowadays? Oh, yeah, a lot of you. It was leadership that changed that. They, instead of focusing on the past and Sherman's march to the sea, they turned to the future and their mayor recruited the movie industry and the Olympics. And that changed Atlanta. Whereas in Birmingham, their mayor continued to focus on the horrors of the economic destruction from the Civil War. Mississippi is still caught up in the economic destruction from the Civil War. And what I came to realize is the, the thing that's tearing our nation apart is holding on to old grievance, holding on to ways we are, um, our memories or our parents' expectations or our, that we're not measuring up. We can never do enough. But it's because we're writing the, reading the wrong story. We're reading a story from our past as opposed to looking to how we make a future together. In the South, they're looking to the war of northern aggression and how accepting Medicaid expansion, for God's sakes, accepting Medicaid expansion would be like surrendering at Appomattox to the federal government. So what we... And then we see this whole idea of be disappointing our parents and this guy in Indianapolis. But it's tax policy that has changed all this. It's got nothing to do with not living up to our parents' expectations. But because we hold on to these expectations of the past, we're suffering in the present. So. What do we do? Well, my little proposal is that we become people of the preamble of the Constitution. That we become missionaries to recover we the people. We cannot leave, if we're gonna be a democracy, we cannot leave out anybody. Annoying as that truth is. I know some people I'd vote off the island. <laughs> but the fact is, is if we're gonna make this democracy work, we need to include everyone. Our tax policy needs to be policy that builds up our nation, not isolates us. It's not fair to have the 1% so far away and not have our help. And it's not fair that tax policy allows them to get that far away. Because it's we the people. It's all of us together. And we remember that. Nice having gray hairs in the crowd. We will know that we do know this preamble in order to form a more perfect union. It's not going to be perfect. But we've got work to do. We can make it better to establish justice. What is justice for the dairy farmers, for the farm workers that make our milk possible? I love the line that cows don't milk themselves. I love that. We will not forget that. 
but we've got to find a way to establish justice that applies to everyone who's building up our society. And that includes immigrants in a wide variety of places, often doing dishes in a restaurant, often doing uh, hourly labor, gardening, uh, the most menial of tasks. How do we make it just for them? Ensure domestic tranquility. Now, until January 6, 2021, I, I was not clear what ensuring domestic tranquility was. But what I know now, <laughs> I live six blocks from the Capitol, so I know now what that means about how do we come together and say we will follow the rules. We trust each other enough to follow the rules. Provide for the common defense. I love the idea of Hanf Hanford, is it Hanford? Hanford. Hanford. Oh, shoot. It's my southern accent that got in the way. But Hanford, what a great project where you can provide for the common defense of the dairy workers and share the information. Spread it around. May 1st, don't go there. But May 2nd, you can go and stock up. But, it, but it's to let it be known why. Promote the general welfare. How, do, how does everybody get access to health care in our nation? How do we ensure that our neighbors have a safe place to live? How do we ensure that people can get to the doctor? That there's enough food to go around if we share? and to secure the blessings of liberty to ourselves and our posterity. This is where I think it's critically important that we of gray-haired people talk to young people. We need to be missionaries. It wasn't always this way, and your generation can make a difference. Your generation has the opportunity to recreate community. That hunger to belong. The screen that you keep looking at might be the way to do it, but I'm not sure about that. But it's about community together. And if we, the people, hold on to our values, rooted in the Constitution, for me, rooted in faith as well, but we hold on to our values and share them, Listen to people who think differently and try to understand. If we open ourselves to different perspectives and can be a welcoming presence, 2024 might be a really important year. Vermont might start a revolution, just saying, in a quiet little nonviolent way. But it could make a difference. And we the people, we the people, know that we don't have to be so spread out. We don't have to be disconnected from the wealthiest at the top. We can be in solidarity with each other. If we know the truth, if we know how people think, and if I'm willing to listen to people who think differently. What a treat! And isn't that democracy? So we the people unencumbered by any power at all, I am going to commission you to become missionaries for a democracy that can work. We need you. It is time. Let's do this together. Thank you very much. <laughs> okay, okay, that's sweet. Quite kind, quite kind. And they told me Vermonters didn't, weren't demonstrative. <laughs> I take that with gratitude. But now we get some questions. We have time for questions, I understand, if that's okay with you all. 
Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm good. I'm right in. I'm right on my mark. Ooh, I'm excited. Okay, if there are questions, comments, not so much comments because you know what happens is sometimes people want to give a speech and then and then we lose people. And you Vermonters wouldn't want to lose somebody, would you? So maybe just a little question, and I'm good at hearing, so I can repeat questions. I think it's going to be the way it's going to work. Okay. Making Haley carry Vermont. <laughs> Missionary work is possible. Leave it to a woman. Excellent. Good point. Good point. Other comment? Yeah. How do you see the role of third parties? Third parties? Disastrous. The problem is we don't have a parliamentarian method. We don't have a parliamentary method. We've got two parties. We have a two-party system. And a two-party system is um, winner take all. And so a third party siphons off from both, either side, both sides. So like the thing that Robert Kennedy's doing right now, it's disaster, disaster. Oh, Ralph Nader, disaster. Outside of that, I'm sure there must have been a third party that worked sometime. The, the way a third party worked was, the way a third party could work, and there was an article in the, or a opinion piece in the Times last week, I think it was, talking about building a new Republican party, and that if the, if there could be Republican leadership, here I'll tell you, I wrote down what their principles were. I want to go. A free, they were calling it a free Republican Party, free of MAGA. Um, they said they needed to accept their exile status, identify as the true Republican Party, uh, develop a set agenda for a post-MAGA future, and to seek the overturn of MAGA and explain that Trumpism was lawlessness. And um, the call to a, a, a lawlessness, moral anarchy, and a conspiratorial thinking, and an assault on democracy. And then the free Republican Party could claim what they really rightfully need to be. And in that sense, I think, because of our two-party system, not parliamentary uh, way of being, that that could be a step into a positive future. But it's the Republicans have to take their party back. I almost was tempted to become a Republican to help them do it, but they didn't seem to want my help. <laughs> it has me worried, but yeah. Sorry, I don't think third parties are a good idea. Yes? It sounds like you've been traveling around the country, and I've tried to remain positive about and the rest of the country is terrifyingly close to putting us off in the air. And you travel around, I'm curious if you listen to people. I still feel like even though it's really strong bag of people, if you listen to them, you hear what is really behind their blind following. I, I do think listening is probably the the key. Um, and and being, you do live in a bubble, I mean, really. But it's a lovely bubble. It's really nice. But I lived in a bubble, too, because I lived in California. It was a bubble. But it's a, a national bubble. It's not a local bubble. And, and I think that sometimes gets lost. But this is where developing friendships in other states or reaching out to relatives in other states about serious conversations is really important. It's the only thing that we've got that can try to weave us back together. And it is too tempting to, um, to dismiss those who disagree. And ironically, that's the MAGA campaign, all this stuff about banning books in the library because you don't like it? 
I mean, that's ridiculous. Aren't we supposed to, in a democracy, develop critical thinking? How are we going to develop critical thinking if we only have things that agree with us? We'll never develop the capacity to question, to, to pursue, to educate. To, I mean, education should be at the heart of wrestling with, with critical questions of our time. But it means we've got to put ourselves in proximity to difference. I, I did have, I think every family must have somebody that's difficult. And so I had this idea, in my, in my family it's my brother, though I did learn it wasn't as bad as I thought. It's just because I'm the oldest, he's the youngest. And so he was always, so I had this idea for creating a um, lending library of difficult relatives. So. <laughs> So we could put our difficult relative in the, the library and somebody could check them out for Thanksgiving. Because <laughs> I was sure that they would do better with my, my brother than I do with him. It's always easier with somebody else, you know. But then I realized my brother would put me in the library and then <laughs> I was, eh, it might be confusing. But do you know what happened is uh, with my brother, so I, I have to be a little careful. I can't rag on him like I used to. Because in, was it the 2018 bus trip, I did something, something on the internet, went viral, and people on the internet started ragging on me. Well, my brother stood up for me. And my sister, who tracks these things, sent me what my brother said. He says, and I'm standing up for my friend and my sister. And it was like, whoa. Maybe it was just family dynamics and it had nothing to do with politics. But, but so I, I have a softer spot in my heart or my head, I'm not sure which, but it, it, it's that reality. We've got to keep at this. That's democracy. It's a challenge. Yeah, in the back. Do you see the solution not only being within the United States in our struggles, but enlisting help from other countries? There used to be great relations out of the abundance of the middle class relationships globally. And that seems to have uh, come into some difficulties, you might say. You might say. It is, do we see, do I see that uh, beyond the U.S. boundaries, can we, are there international connections that can be supportive? Unfortunately, the U.S. has exported much of our tax policy. And so we have the same shrinking of the middle class as everybody else. So it's almost like we need some new models of how, how do we leverage enough power to create sharing. And that's why labor organizing is important. That's why educating about Vermont policy is important. That's why making sure that we know where food comes from, where we talk to our friends and neighbors about difficult issues, it, it's really up to us. Now I will tell you, having visited France a few times, is that their social policy is night and day ahead of ours. I mean, it, it's, it's stunning. They pay a lot in taxes, but they get a lot in service. And it's that trade-off when we think we've got to do it on our own. This is where the myth of who we are is individualism. Is our, is our Achilles heel. Because the French, their identidad is by being French, you know. And so they have a much stronger sense of group and shared commitment so that a, a, a pregnant woman gets a year's mater paid maternity leave, gets home health aides come into the house as part of her maternity leave, gets education for caring for the next generation, that kids in school 
learn how to sit at a table and serve each other, and they have four and five course meals, truly in the French way, you know. And so it is possible to learn from other cultures how to do it, but I think the biggest problem is our individualism. Can we see each other as community? That's the challenge. And if I share responsibility with you, then we can help each other. Yeah. You, uh, you have talked a lot about income tax policy. Yeah. Yeah. There is also a wide disparity in terms of wealth taxes. <gasps> And in Vermont, we are currently experiencing a crisis in education because education is funded primarily through a wealth tax, otherwise on property. property. Yeah. Yeah. So there's a there's another. So I'm asking a comment. Make whatever comment you want out of that. <laughs> This melange of a concern. Uh, education is a worry because financing is through property taxes and it's local property taxes. And one of the challenges with um, property is that there's not always uh, what we call liquidity, cash to go with it, especially if you've inherited property. Farms, I understand, probably have a different tax bracket definition, but the challenge is inherited farms, you don't inherit wealth to go along with it, and so then that creates a, a challenge when it comes to paying property tax. Um, the, the challenge in the South, you see this property, the idea that our education is, is funded by property taxes is ridiculous, but it was an effort at local control. And so local control if the local people were paying the property tax, then they could support their school and control it in the way they want. And that's the fuel behind it. But the fact that it's creating bad education because it's not adequately funding education goes back to individualism, where I could send my child, where's my, oh, down here, my, my, my top 1%, whose name I forgot, Jack? Jess. Jess. He could send his child any place to school. So it doesn't really matter to him. But you get the bottom 80% fighting about this. But the ones who have more clout and power are the 1% or the 5%. And so you don't get a change because you just get bickering, which is a lot about books and all this other stuff, libraries. But it's not really about how do we get funding, adequate funding. And so that's where, that's why I think that it's we the people. It's coming to a place where we say, we the people care about the next generation and we're gonna make a difference. We're gonna invest in our future. We're gonna invest in our kids if we wanna make this nation work. And so whether it's at a state level or, uh, we'd have to start at state levels. We, we could never go national uh, unless for another 100 years. Um, because of the, the various state realities. But at least in a state like Vermont, you could begin to talk about that. What is, what is a, like a profit sharing approach? How do we care for our future? Let's keep our kids. Let's educate them. What a thought. And not just with their own truth, but with something a little more. Another question? Got it? Wait a minute, is there some? Oh, yep. I think that you would give some advice to those people who say, I don't know who I want to vote for this year, so I might not vote at all. I don't like something that Joe Biden has done, and I certainly don't like something that Trump has done. Tell us what we can tell to those people who say, I'm just going to stay home this time. Well, what can you say to people who are going to stay home? Depends who you're more likely to vote for in my book. <laughs> Staying home might not be a bad bet.
There's nothing like pragmatism in politics, you know. I think that I was with an Uber driver in Chicago, and it was, she had gotten, uh, she was from Cameroon, she had just become a citizen. This was gonna be her first election, and uh, that where she got to vote, and she didn't know who she was gonna vote for. I was like, what? <laughs> Hopefully by the end of the ride, she had. <laughs> But is it show and flim flam? Anger? Or, or are you touching in with the anger? And the ringling brother Barnum and Bailey circus? Or do you care about some thoughtful policy? And that's where democracy is not entertainment. And that's what one party has wrong right now. Democracy's work. It's organizing, it's lobbying, it's being involved. And it's not perfect. But that's why it's democracy, because we stay at it. And that for me is the difference between the current Republican Party as entertainment. Horrifying entertainment, but entertainment. Okay. Oh, one one last one. We have time. One last one. Then I want to end with a poem. About yeah. Oh wait, we got two then. Because I, I didn't. That's okay. Go ahead. Go ahead. Um, how do you talk to the five percent and get them convince them that they should relinquish their wealth <laughs> for the common good? <laughs> I believe theft might be the only way. No. Um, I was at a dinner, I was at a dinner and um, in Boise, I, I mentioned this in my, in my little homily or sermon, whatever, at church, but it was five conservative couples, self-identified conservative couples, and um, one guy was complaining, very rich, wealthy, entrepreneurs, uh, the guys were libertarian and the women were just angry. It was, it was so interesting. But anyway, um, this one guy kept complaining, well, you know, the wealthy pay 40% of all the taxes. <laughs> well, if that's true, you also have 40% of the income. Don't you think that's fair? Uh, we don't. We don't have forty percent of the income. Well, you know, it's all egalitarian. They've got the fifties and sixties model in their head, and they don't know the reality that we saw. And so, the 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 hardest piece is breaking down the myth that we're all middle class. The top five percent think they're in the middle class, because that's our our ethos as a nation. And so helping them see where they are in, in reality, maybe. But I have a hunch that maybe a better style would be to s help um, appeal to their patriotism and making our nation better, is that they succeeded because our nation is amazing and supports this entrepreneurial activity. I mean, we're very inventive and imaginative and creative and all these kinds of things as a nation. France is way less creative, but a lot nicer to live in. So how do we help them see a benefit in their investment in the US future, especially in kids, to make a difference? That's my... But they don't, they don't believe that it's a result of, their common, of the common um, yeah. world Remember? They created their wealth. They did it themselves. I know, isn't that crazy? <laughs> they did it themselves. They paved the highway. They plowed the roads. They created the internet. They got the delivery system. I did it myself. Me, Daniel Boone, out making my log cabin all by myself. That's crazy. That's crazy. It doesn't help. So make friends with them first. And then if they get too frustrating, check them into my library where you can check out <laughs> difficult friends. 
Okay, last question in the back, and then we're going to end with a poem. Yeah, in the white here. Yes, yes, you. Are we lost? Are set under the system we have? How do we get parliamentarian or someone? Oh, the third party question. How do we get to a parliamentarian system? Another 200 years, maybe? Yeah, I don't, I don't see a way how to do it. I don't see how to do it. Parliamentary system is like they have in Britain or uh, many uh, democracies where um, a plurality of, if your party wins the most votes, but it's just a plurality, you have to join with another party in order to become the ruling party. And you have to work in coalition government. And that coalition government then only survives as long as the coalition holds together. Right now we've got either or, fairly evenly divided. And so some think to break the power structure of the current reality, we need to move to a parliamentarian system, parliamentary system. I, uh, I'm such a pragmatic, I'm political, I'm pragmatic. I just want to get it done. Uh, I don't think it's going to happen. Maybe. But that's why I thought the idea of having the real Republican Party, the true Republican Party, or free Republican Party, what the New York Times talked about, could be a way to begin to move in that direction. It's the closest thing we've got. Okay, now that I've depressed you, um, I wanted to close, I think I can do it, I haven't used it in a while, but I have, occasionally I write poetry. And um, I wrote this poem called Loves and Fish. And I'm hoping that most of you know the Christian reference in the Christian scriptures to the miracle of loaves and fish. And what it was, was Jesus was followed by the crowd and the apostles got nervous that they were going to get hungry and grumpy. And so the apostles go to Jesus and say, send them back to town. Please tell them to go get food. It's you know past lunchtime or dinner time. This is terrible. And uh, Jesus says to the apostles, feed them yourselves. And good old Peter, my patron, says, well, all we've got are a couple of day old loaves of bread and a couple of stinky fish. What's that among so many? And Jesus goes, oh, brother. And so Jesus tells the group to sit down in groups of 50, ever the community organizer, good work, in groups of 50. And he blesses the bread, he blesses the fish, and he gives it to them to hand out. And Matthew's Gospel says 5,000 men were fed to say nothing of the women and children. Well, now, quite frankly, that made me mad. <laughs> what are we, chopped liver, I ask you? So I prayed about it, and I pray about many things, kind of odd, but what I discovered in my prayer was they only counted the ones who thought it was a miracle. The women knew they'd brought snacks from home and the real thing was sharing. <laughs> so th this, is my, this is my prayer for us in this challenging time. And it's called Loaves and Fish. I always joked that the miracle of loaves and fish was sharing. The women always knew this. But in this moment of need and notoriety, I ache, tremble, almost weep at folks so hungry, malnourished, faced with spiritual famine of epic proportions. Apostle-like I whine. What are we among so many? The consistent 2,000 year old ever new response is this. Blessed and broken, you are enough. I savor the blessed, cower at the broken, and pray.
to be enough. Thank you very much. Just a reminder to please visit the groups tabling in the gallery. And I think there's also some refreshments too um, that uh, for, for a donation if you want to visit there. And I'm hoping that Sister Simone will join you in the gallery if you want to say hello. <laughs> <laughs>